there's an issue that's already been on the front burner of our churches for some time, but it seems to only be getting more intense, and it's the lack of ministers for the churches who are looking. Carson Reed, who is the Vice President of Church Relations at Abilene Christian, the Executive Director of the Cyber Institute, wrote an article about this about two weeks ago on their Mosaic blog. I'm going to put a link to that blog in the description. I encourage you to subscribe to their blog. It's a really valuable resource. And in that article, he gives four reasons why there's a shortage of preachers and ministers and churches of Christ. And then he gives five signs of health, signs that when he sees these in a church that he finds it to be more of a hopeful situation. I want to walk through his four reasons and his five signs of health. Cybert Institute through ACU works to connect ministers and churches, and they've been doing this for a really long time. Their boots on the ground, they know the numbers, numbers of ministers and numbers of churches who are looking to connect. One of the first things he says is, he says, I'm usually slow to use the word crisis to describe a situation, but it may well be apt for our day. In a normal season, they would have about the same number of churches and the same numbers of ministers looking. Now they have in a typical month about 15 churches that are looking and maybe, he says, we may have one minister. So that means some months they have no minister, right? Maybe even many months, there is no minister that they have looking. Uh, a ministry that has been doing this for a long, long time, that is well known, that is well established, and people are not going to them to find churches. And probably the reason for that is because they're not going back into congregational ministry. If they did, they'd probably go to Cyber. They'd probably go to, to Carson Reed and ACU and ask for help because they're excellent at doing what they do. But they're not doing what a lot of ministers are doing. They're going into parachurch ministries. They're going into nonprofits. They're going into chaplaincies and hospices and hospitals and things like that. And the feedback as I posted this online and shared this, that I heard from a lot of ministers who, who said, I'm one of the ones who stepped out. I'm one of the ones who's not coming back. They've gone into chaplaincy. And what they're saying is, this is why I got into ministry. I finally found a context where I can use my gifts. I can serve people and love people well. And that's really a sad thing to be to, to, to say, like, I finally, after all the years I've been in ministry, I finally found this outside the church. That's a, a sad commentary on the way things go in some places. Not every place. There's some amazing churches out there who are empowering their ministers, who are working side by side, who have a vision and a direction, who are executing things with excellence and intentionality. It happens. But unfortunately, there's a lot of church hurt out there. And some of the most church hurt people are ministers. Let's look at the four things that Carson Reed says are part of the problem. The first problem, he says, is that every church member, in essence, is like your boss. Because really all it takes is for one church member to complain for an eldership that doesn't really have a vision or a Matthew 18 mindset of turning people back to the one who has the problem, the one they have the problem with, is it's like having 300 bosses in a 300-member church. And so what ends up happening is like whiplash, PTSD, uh, anxiety, worry, because all of a sudden you're just being jerked around in all these different directions, and it just creates an absolute spiritual dryness, a spiritual wilderness for ministers. He says, so a lot of ministers out of frustration and a bone-deep burnout are walking away from ministry. Nearly every week I have a conversation with a minister who is exhausted and disappointed, longing for his congregation to, quote, play better in the sandbox of Christian witness, yet languishing in intramural debates that threaten the life and testimony of the congregation to the world saying like, you get into ministry to minister, you get into ministry to help people and to change lives. But what they're finding is I'm just worn out and exhausted by all the debate, all the minutiae and, and fine tuning this of all the things that I can and can't say because people are going to get frustrated. And so there's just absolute burnout and frustration. People are just leaving. They're saying, I just can't do this again. The second thing is he says, a lot of times they get this question, why aren't the universities turning out more ministers? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. The one that he mentions is, well, people are not sending their kids to us to become ministers. Instead, they're turning them over to us to become doctors and lawyers, entrepreneurs, engineers, lawyers, teachers, and many other good and useful professions. However, and I believe that you, my reader, might agree that churches are not commonly cultivating the hearts and passions of young people to enter ministry. Amen. Absolutely. That is 100% the case. In fact, there's a lot of parents who just encourage their kids not to enter into ministry, and the reason for that is... They look at how their minister is treated and they go, I don't want that for my kid. You know, there's a lot of people with gifts for ministry who don't seek it out in church. They seek it out in the nonprofit world. They seek to use those talents and abilities in other arenas where they can truly feel free to use their gifts. The third thing he says is churches are in decline and they just don't have the budgets to support a full-time minister. So there's a lot of big churches in big cities that can afford a large staff, but at the end of the day, 
people either are not going into ministry or not continuing in ministry because the churches may not be able to support a living wage. If you if you read the classified ads on churches who are looking for ministers, often you'll see a very low salary or no salary listed, and it'll say, okay, you got to live in a parsonage, you're going to live next to the church. Well, guess what? Anytime the person needs to get in the front door at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, guess what they're going to do? They're going to walk over to the parsonage and knock on your door because you're a minister and you're supposed to always be available. And, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants to do that. And not only that, Carson Reed says, but they expect your spouse to be fully on board. It's like your, your spouse is like this full-time volunteer. There's often no regard for the wife of this person or, or how she's to be treated or her time. She's probably a professional because the minister is probably not making as much as needed to you know, provide for the family. And so she's probably working, but is expected somewhat to be an employee of the church for free. It's like some churches have this mindset that they're getting two for one when they hire a preacher and they're already not paying the preacher enough. The fourth problem is, he says, that ministers' voices are often marginalized. They bring the preacher in for an interview. They talk about maybe even vision, direction of the church, how they go about things. They value the person while they're there. They bend over backwards for them in the interview process, typically take you out to dinner, you know, put on the best foot forward, and then you, you accept the position and you come and it's like, well, we don't really value your voice at all. That's what these volunteer people over here do who have no theological training, who have no ministry expertise or experience. It's really frustrating to be in that position where a minister's voice is not valued, but you have all the responsibility. Like, you, th there is full accountability for your actions, which is a good thing, all the responsibility, but no voice. And that is a really frustrating place to be especially if you feel like you've been called to this place, God has brought you there, and then you are completely undermined and devalued is, is a very frustrating place to be. And so this contributes to that bone dry weariness, that absolute burnout that so many ministers experience. Let's talk about a few more things that, that um, Carson Reed did not mention. A lot of what's happening is as a, as a Bible student comes to the university, they're being mentored by a professor to become a professor. This is what they're seeing in their role models and examples in the classroom. So what happens is you're being mentored by an academic, which is fine. Uh, academic people are wonderful. Uh, I tend into that myself. But you're being discipled by an academic to be an academic because they're not in the ministry world. Uh, they, they are full-time into their profession as a scholar and an instructor, a teacher, professor. So your mentor is no longer in ministry. Your mentor is not preaching on Sunday. Your mentor is not doing pastoral work. Your mentor is not evangelistic. So your model of, of, of a Christian mature person is not in ministry anymore. And the people who are coming out of these universities, my point being very simply, are not wanting to go into ministry. It's not what they've seen. It's not what they've been encouraged necessarily to do. Uh, and that's no fault of the university. It's just the way that it's been set up. Another piece is, again, um, these young people have seen how their minister has been treated, either for the good or for the bad. And I can only wonder that the people who truly want to go into congregational ministry probably had wonderful examples of how ministers were treated in their congregations. They were treated with love, respect, kindness, dignity, um, celebration, etc. And not that we are so, as ministers, should be so sensitive and narcissistic that it needs to all revolve around us. But we, uh, if, if you see your minister constantly being treated poorly, um, or that his voice is undermined and diminished constantly, uh, it's not going to be very appealing to go into something where you are like, well, that's what's going to happen to me. Why would I want to put myself in that position? Or say, and we have a video on this, I'll put a card up on this as well on the screen. If you've watched minister after minister get let go through really weird circumstances and it was kind of mysterious and no one understood and they just had to leave, uh, why would you want to be a part of that? So what's happening is churches are sending a message as to whether ministry is a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, eldership needs to think about the kind of message they're sending to the church and to the young people and how they're treating their minister. So here are the five signs of health, he says, that he finds hopeful. Number one, churches that are actively developing internships and residencies and partnerships with theological schools to train and develop a new generation of ministers. So he's saying churches come to them and say, like, how can we work with you to develop an internship? Or maybe some of your students can work with us or some of our young people can, can work with you to kind of have a partnership here uh, to, to teach and to train people in ministry. Number two, churches that are creatively utilizing bivocational ministers. Todd Wilson of Exponential says, and I believe 100% he's right, that the future of ministry is bivocational. Uh, this is Paul's model. He was a tent maker. He had another source of income. As churches shrink, as budgets go down, 
uh, the ability to support a full-time minister is going to also go down. But what that allows a minister to do is to not be completely dependent upon the church for income, which then allows a little bit more freedom from anxiety or worry to speak truthfully and to teach truthfully. And it's really sad that that even has to be said. We should always be free to speak truthfully. But the truth of the matter is, in some context, a minister is not safe to speak truthfully because their salary may be on the line because of well-to-do member may get frustrated and undermine them. Number three, churches that actively value their ministers by welcoming their wisdom and utilizing their leadership gifts. Amen to that. So again, you have a minister who has 15 years of full-time ministry experience, who has a master's degree, has been through like eight years of school, uh, and has been in multiple congregations, has seen a lot of things, probably knows the congregation well, if they're pastorally minded, is in the lives of the congregation, then the eldership is not theologically trained, has experience in one congregation, and is completely volunteer. And so why would you not listen to the voice of the minister? Why would you undermine the voice of the minister rather than welcome their wisdom and utilize their gifts? So if you're an eldership or an elder watching this, I hope that you'll really consider how can you welcome and affirm the gifts of your ministers? How can you do that publicly, not just behind the scenes in a meeting, but publicly to speak well of them? Number four, Churches that help ministers to be compensated appropriately. If you want a good quality minister, you're going to need to compensate them well. Number five, churches that help create boundaries for ministers in order to keep them from burning out. Cyber Institute has CMI and MSN where they help uh, ministers' marriages and help ministers to grow more deeply in spiritual disciplines and contemplative prayer in order to have a solid uh, connection with God to not face as much burnout. And that's a really wonderful program. I hope if you're a minister watching this, you'll look at those links. I'll put them in the description to CMI and MSN so that you can find out more about that. So he ends by saying, do we have a crisis? He finally says it out direct. I believe so. Yet I also believe that resilient congregations pursuing God's purposes in the world will find healthy and constructive ways to prepare, support, nurture, and partner with ministers in the days to come. It's gonna take creativity. You may have to work with someone bivocationally, which means they have less time for the church to expect their wife to be a full-time volunteer. You need to really compensate people well for the work that they're doing. And that's not going to work everywhere. Uh, but we also need to just love and respect each other, to value each other's voices, and to do that in a public way where ministers affirm elders, elders affirm ministers before the congregation uh, so that people can see a healthy connection, healthy relationship, healthy direction that is mutual. So yes, there's a shortage. Yes, it's a problem. But here's the good news. This is going to force churches to get creative, to think outside the box. It's going to mobilize members into ministry to preach and teach and carry on the work of the church to not be solely dependent upon a paid professional to take on and take care of the ministry of the church. It will. I, this is the biggest thing that I, that I want to say about all this. Churches, by necessity, are going to finally mobilize their members back into ministry, which then may well help grow the church again. This should be our prayer. We need to be in prayer about this. You know, it's it, we, we also need to lose the business mindset of what it looks like to hire a minister. You know, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, when they are um, sending out, selecting Paul and Barnabas for this first missionary journey, I believe it's Acts 13, 1 through 4, 1 through 5, it says that they selected them for this calling, this ministry, through fasting and prayer. Never seen that happen. Totally biblical. If you're going to select a minister, there should be fasting and prayer. We should call upon the congregation, anyone who's healthy enough to do it, to fast and ask God to make clear the direction and the decision of who this needs to be. The problem is, I think, and I don't want to belabor this too hard, is that we've kind of stopped thinking that God informs us like that, but I don't believe that anymore. I believe God still can, God still does. He can still convict our hearts. He can still move us in a direction. He can literally help you choose your next minister if you'll listen. If you'll pray fast and pay attention, God will direct you in that. Instead of us having this corporate business mindset that we can figure this out on our own and we can have committees and we can gather this up just like you would hire a new dentist or at the dental office or a new lawyer for the law firm, we take those same principles and we bring them into the church. And now we're starting very day one with a new person not making spiritual decisions in the hiring process. Big red flag, right? So just consider how your processes in getting a minister are going to reflect life after getting the position. If you're a minister watching this and you're young in ministry and you're interviewing at churches, pay attention to the, the hiring process and pay attention to how spiritually minded and inclusive or exclusive it is. Is it corporately minded, business minded, or is it Holy Spirit biblically minded? 
and that's going to tell you a lot about the days to come. Don't expect people to act better after they hire you than before they hired you. Uh, that's probably not likely. So thank you so much for watching it. Give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that now, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.